All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. The event today is being hosted by the Vanderbilt Project on Unity and American Democracy. Uh, and today I have four Hill staffers with me from Capitol Hill. They're all based up in DC. We have two Republicans, two Democrats who basically work behind the curtain and are going to talk to us about what it's really like to work on the Hill you know, what their job really entails day in and day out. And then also we're going to get into bipartisanship and what it looks like to work together, you know, behind the curtain and basically where all of that starts. So let's go ahead and get into introductions. Uh, first, I have Ivelisse Poya Garcia. Um, Ivelisse is our policy director for the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, and she basically advises Representative Raul Ruiz. Thank you. Um, and she has worked on the Hill for how many years, I believe? Six years. And she has experience both in the Senate and the House, but currently is serving in the House. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about what it's like to work over there, work for a caucus. You know, a lot of folks don't know what that looks like. So she's going to tell us a little bit about that. Um, and we'll get into that soon. Then I have Nick Adams. Nick is a staffer on the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. Nick, could you give us a wave? Hey. <laughs> um, he is an advisor as well to Senator John Cornyn from Texas. And then we also have a Vanderbilt alum with us. He graduated in 2001, Jeremy Hayes, if you wanna give us a little wave. Hey, uh, Jeremy, um, he is on the Senate Homeland Security Committee. He advises uh, Senator Rob Portman from Ohio. Um, he's a senior professional staff member and Jeremy has a lot of experience working on various committees. He's worked for so many members in the Senate. I mean, he just has a wealth of experience to bring to the table. Uh, he's been in the Senate for, for a really long time. So um, also, graduated from Vanderbilt in 2001 and just shows what Vanderbilt alums can bring to DC, right? Um, then we have Ian Bryan. Ian, he is in Senator Diane, Diane Feinstein's office. He works on, is it military issues, national security? He's a legislative assistant. Is that right, Ian? Yes, uh, defense, foreign policy, and veterans issues. Right. Um, and Ian's gonna talk to us a little bit about coming onto the Hill a bit later in his career, really. Um, we're gonna get into that because I think that's a really interesting route. Everybody has a very different route that they took to get to DC, to come onto the Hill. Um, and I really wanna jump into that. So could you all first just give us a description, if you could sum up what you do day in and day out, what your job description is in one or two sentences. Ivelisse, I wanna start with you because I think that you have a really interesting you know, journey to the Hill, um, but also what you do is very different. It's, I don't think it's what a traditional, you know, college student who's going to DC to intern thinks of doing. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Of course. So I'm the policy director of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, which means that my job is to manage um, and pass bills uh, and the legislative agenda of the 38 members of Congress and senators are part of the Hispanic Caucus. Um, we're all Democrats, um, and we work, you know, along party lines, but we also have a very ideological different um, caucus. Um, so, yeah, I think that's my summary, and the, the gist of my job is to know the members' priorities, um, know where to get the answers uh, as fast as possible, and to advance the legislative agenda. Thanks, Evelise. Um, I, I think we're going to get more into that a little bit later because it's such an interesting role, um, especially since you serve a very diverse caucus. Um, Nick, let's go to you. Um, sum up what you do day in and day out. Sure, I'll try and do that in two sentences. But first of all, thanks, right Grace, for, uh, for having me on uh, the panel today. I really appreciate you reaching out. So I'm a professional staff member on the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee. Um, and essentially what the committee does is conduct oversight of the intelligence community. So all of the um, different agencies that conduct intelligence on behalf of the US government, um, our job is to do oversight. 
Um, in addition to that, um, I work for Senator John Cornyn from Texas. He's a member of the committee and I prepare him for hearings. Um, I do all the background. And then I have a portfolio that I manage on the committee as well that I'm responsible for uh, to prepare other members uh, when those topics come up. So that's um, the summary, but I'm sure we can get a bit more into that as well. Absolutely. Everybody wants to know what goes on behind those secret intelligence committees and everything. <laughs> and all the agencies, right? Um, all right, Jeremy, tell us what you do. <laughs> Sum it up in a couple of sentences with the Homeland Security Committee. Sure, um, yeah, we're, uh, I'm on the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee. Um, has pretty wide jurisdiction over Homeland Security issues as well as government affairs issues, um, such as uh, contracting policy, acquisition policies. Um, and so I work on contracting acquisition policies and laws and regulations, as well as border security. Um, uh, issues, which are obviously in the news right now. Uh, but, you know, our committee, it's an interesting moment in time. Um, all the Senate committees right now, we're evenly split. We have seven Democrats and seven Republicans. Uh, the Democrats are in charge. They're, they're in the majority, despite the 50-50. Uh, so our chairman is a Democrat. Uh, but we work very well with, uh, with our other staffers to try to get legislation that can be bipartisan and kind of, it can pass through a 50-50 a divided Senate. Yeah, I, I really hope we have time to get into that a little bit later. It's, it's, it's a really interesting um, sort of power makeup in the Senate right now uh, with this Congress and sort of what that looks like behind the scenes, how that's working, um, how it might promote bipartisanship or, or, I don't know, stall it a little bit. But Ian, let's go to you. I want to hear about what you do with Senator Dianne Feinstein and advising her. And, you know, when did you come onto the Hill as well? Uh, so I only arrived in May, so uh, I have not been here long, uh, but I suppose it's probably later in my career than for anyone else on the panel. So I, we can talk about that more if you'd like. Um, my job changes day to day based on whatever Senator Feinstein is interested in in my portfolio and what the people of California uh, want to engage the senator on and what they're interested in. So it's everything from preparing the senator for uh, hearings on defense uh, issues um, or uh, engaging with constituents that have concerns or interests in my portfolio. So it, it's it's pretty broad. And Ian, how did you, just tell us, how did you land the job? How did you end up back on the Hill at this point in your career? And Or not back on the Hill, on the Hill, because you have a pretty impressive career that I, I didn't explain everybody's background because then I'd be the one talking this whole time. So I want to say that to you all. <laughs> but Ian, tell us, how did you get there? Uh, well, I retired from the military a couple of years ago and took a couple of years off uh, and then decided it was I was ready to go back to work. And I my last couple of assignments in the military, I had done congressional relations. And so I, I knew a lot of people that worked for the Senate. And uh, it looked like interesting, meaningful work. So um, I started sending some resumes around and trying to work my network, and um, uh, it took several months, uh, but then I got a call from Senator Feinstein's office uh, asking if I'd be interested in interviewing, and then once that started, it proceeded very quickly, and within a couple of weeks, I was at my desk in the office. Wow. Um, and so persistence, if, you know, getting onto the Hill, it requires a lot of persistence, no matter what sort of background you bring to the table. And I mean, Ian, could you elaborate a little bit more on your background in the military and, and you know, the years that you spent serving there? Uh, so I was uh, active duty. I was a pilot uh, for about 10 years and then I got out and went to law school and moved back home to Chattanooga and practiced law for a few years and um, then became a, a part-time National Guard pilot. Uh, and then I just kind of fell into the chance to do full-time work again, doing some, some teaching in the Air Force, which I really enjoyed. And at that point, I decided I would, I would uh, push it through to a full career. And so I came to Washington to do congressional affairs. Um, and I did that for several years, did a little procurement work, and, um, and then uh, retired and took my two years off, which was great, uh, before getting here. And then you couldn't get enough. You had to come back. <laughs> That's right. I, I had to come back. Um, right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ian. Um, Jeremy, so you graduated from Vanderbilt in 2001. Tell us then 
what you did from there. And, and also people don't know you graduated in, you know, May, 2001 and, you were in the ROTC, graduated with distinction, is that right? And you, you know, went on thinking that you'd have a certain path and maybe that changed a few months later. You know what I'm getting to, so. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, graduated in 2001 uh, with, a, with an assignment to Germany uh, in the Army uh, in the Signal Corps and was really excited about that. And obviously we had, we had the events of 9-11. Um, uh, I ended up still going to Germany um, and uh, from there deployed to Kuwait and Iraq uh, for Operation Iraqi Freedom. Um, and uh, after that deployment, I uh, was uh, back in Germany for about nine months. And then uh, I, was, I, was, I was then deployed to Afghanistan for one year uh, after that. Um, so, uh, you know, my military service was five years. It was highly rewarding. Um, you know, my, my uh, fellow uh, Vanderbilt grads, I still, I still talk to them today, uh, the officers that I served with uh, in ROTC. Um, and uh, so, I, but I'd, I'd gotten out of the military after two tours, um, was looking for the next thing to do, but still wanted to serve the country. So uh, I ended up working in Washington um, in the Pentagon uh, for congressional affairs, kind of similar to what Ian was doing. Um, and uh, uh, congressional affairs was a great way as a, as a footstep to get to Capitol Hill um, because uh, uh, it, it just you, you get to you get to meet the congressmen and the staffers and other things like that. And every uh, every agency on, in the D.C. has a, a legislative affairs department. So uh, I think my advice to anyone looking for a job on Capitol Hill who may be having a hard time. Uh, to go go work for a legislative affairs department. You'll get that experience, and you'll be able to do that. And um, I guess I should add, I could add here that I applied for 13 jobs and was turned down for 12 of them uh, before the the 13th <laughs> one said yes. Uh, so to Ian's point and to your point, persistence is key. Don't be discouraged. Uh, sometimes it takes 13 uh, 13 interviews uh, to get uh, and even more you know applications that you never even hear back from. So, um, but it uh, it uh, can pay off. But lucky number 13. Yeah. Uh, and you have, sir, how many offices have you been with on the Hill? Uh, I've worked for some, seven senators. Yeah. I, I just count by senators, not by offices at this point. So seven senators. Jeremy has a, a lot of experience to bring to the table um, and in a lot of efforts that he's been a part of, we're going to get into. Um, Nick, going back to you, tell us how you ended up coming to the Hill, because you had as well an extensive career in the military. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that and then how you decided eventually to come to the Hill. Sure, uh, thanks. So I spent 10 years on active duty uh, and my first assignment was in Germany as well. Uh, and this was uh, in 2006. So we, we knew there was two wars going on and uh, you know there was, there was a very good chance I was going somewhere. So. Um, I spent six years of my 10 years in the special operations community. So um, I never had the full year long deployments that Jeremy had. I had several um, shorter ones and that took me to Afghanistan, Iraq, Jordan, North Africa, uh, parts of Europe. Um, and it was like Jeremy said, I would agree. It was a very rewarding uh, 10 years, uh, but I hit a point where I wanted to do something different. Uh, and the, the way that I've kind of thought about it was, I spent 10 years carrying out foreign policy and I thought I might help shape it instead. Uh, and so uh, the Hill was kind of the opportunity to do that. To be fair, I didn't know that I wanted to come to the Hill uh, when I did leave the Army. I, um, I, I left and did a one-year grad program at Johns Hopkins SICE. Um, and to, to be completely honest, I didn't know what Hill staffers did up until this point because what does Congress actually do, right? Uh, that's, that's what I thought up until, until I- Do uh, they do you know, anything? Yeah, right? <laughs> so I came to DC and I was like, okay, there's, there's, there's staff and they do stuff and it's not just making coffee. This looks pretty interesting. So I, um, I, I actually met uh, a, a SICE alumni uh, who worked for John McCain at the time, uh, sat down and had coffee. And, and again, I think everyone's mentioned persistence. Uh, the other thing I would throw in there is aggressive networking um, because, you know, it's really um, talking to a lot of people who do what you're interested in uh, and not necessarily asking them for a job, but just un getting an understanding of what it is they do uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it helps you navigate where you want to go. And two, uh, it, really, it really gives you an idea of, do I, do I want to do this? Uh, for me, the answer uh, was yes, I did. Um, and I ended up getting a call 
about six or seven months after my first coffee, uh, several coffees in between that, I should add. Um, but I got a call from uh, the chief of staff of an Ohio congressman, uh, Brad Wenstrup at the time, uh, who was on the Armed Services Committee, uh, who offered me a job after about three interviews with his staff and then with him. Uh, and then I spent a year on the House side uh, before coming to the Senate. And I've been in the Senate, uh, actually on the Hill now, about four years and on, about, about three years on, on the Senate side. So you have experience in both chambers, right? And yeah. uh, and now having experience working for a personal office as well as a committee, we're going to get into a little bit about the differences there. I think that a lot of you can speak to what those differences are. Um, and you know, it's interesting. It's it's pretty dynamic. Um, Ivelisse, I I wanted to come to you last to hear about your story because I think your story is so unique and encouraging. Could you tell us about how you ended up coming to DC, um, and also when you came to the United States and what your initial plans were, what they turned into and how they led you to where you are today. Thank you. I knew you were gonna leave last. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I, it was 2011 and I was in law school, finishing law school in Peru. Um, and then I came to visit my dad in California. And then I started taking some English classes uh, which later turned into an exchange program. Um, I did it for six months and then I extended six months, six more months. So then my mom in Peru um, got pregnant with twins. So she told me, you know, I'm just going to have to change, figure out what you want to do, or you can come back to law school and finish and graduate. So I ended up staying. I filled out my own uh, green card paperwork because we didn't have money for a lawyer. And it turned out to be successful and I ended up staying. And um, first things that I didn't, the first thing that I wanted to do is to continue my legal education in the United States. Turns out that, um, you need a bachelor's degree in the United States to go to law school. Uh, great. So I go to the college and I say, I need a bachelor's degree. Uh, well, it turns out that it was a community college. I had no idea what community meant in front of college. I thought it was just college, university, whatever, same thing. No. Um, so I ended up transferring, <clears throat> graduated from UCLA, but in the meantime, entered out that process, I met Congressman Ruiz and I worked for his campaign since he first ran for office in 2012. And I worked in his campaign office. I interned for him in his district office. I brought him to speak on campus um, and we developed a mentor-mentee relationship. Um, and then um, after that, uh, it was my last, my senior year of you know, uh, um, college, and I get an internship with Senator Barbara Boxer, uh, and later I got offered a job um, on the Hill full time as a staff assistant, and then she retired. <clears throat> I spent a year with her, and then she retired, and I go back to the congressman, lost, right, because I thought, okay, do I want to go to law school now? No, I, Capitol Hill is inducing me, so um, I decided to um, email the congressman and I said, congressman, I'm ready. And he said, sure, let's, let's bring you here. So yeah, it has been a journey of learning English by myself, learning the system by myself, learning what a scantron was, learning what a community college was. Um, and also on the Hill, learning all of the American politics, American history, watching tons of movies, watching tons of documentaries. I had no idea what happened between Bush and Al Gore and, you know, all those things that normal politicos come to the Hill knowing, and I had no idea. So I had to fake it till I made it. I, that's pretty much how I ended up here. And isn't that kind of the, uh, the needle that threads everybody together on the hills, sort of faking it till you make it, right? Um, but Emily's, your story is just so inspiring and um, it's unique, but also I think there are a lot of folks on the Hill who you know, have had their struggles getting there and it's really just empowered them ultimately. And uh, I wanna talk a little bit more about that, but before we get there, um, you, know, you and Nick have both worked in the House and the Senate and Emily's, you were just talking about how uh, Congressman Reese has been a mentor for you. And I, I you know, I think there's a big difference in how the offices operate between the House and the Senate. The House is, you know, there's so many more representatives in the House, and 
you know, the offices are much smaller, the staff is smaller. And so it's a little bit more intimate in some ways. Um, but also, I just wonder if you guys could speak to the differences that you saw initially and then learned over time between working in the House, working for a representative versus working in the Senate for a senator. Um, I don't know if you two want to piggyback. Nick and Italy's also know each other as friends. So yeah. <laughs> and they work together. They have a history. So yeah, it's, it's talk awesome. about that. Absolutely. I, I will pick about where I like last left it because I just want to say to all three panelists here, thank you for your service. It's I'm I think I'm the only one that doesn't have like a military background, but it is a <clears throat> it is a main issue area that I have been working on all my years in Congress, um, handling national security, military, and veterans affairs issues, um, specifically when it comes to ex toxic exposures and burn pits, and that's how Nick and I met. Uh, so I don't know, Nick, do you want to take the lead on how we met and all the work? Yeah, um, and obviously, you know, thanks for everything you did uh, in that space, Ivelisse, because I think before you and I talked about burn pits, um, it's not something that I'd worked on extensively at all. It was something that I was obviously aware of, having served um, in Afghanistan where there was a burn pit on our base. Uh, so it was one of those things that I thought would be very interesting to discuss in a bit more in a bit more detail. So I think the first time uh, you and I really spoke, uh, it was actually a um, a, um, I don't want to call it a party. It was like, I think Congressman Reese's office came over to Congressman Wenstrup's office, right? You guys all came over. Oh, uh, yeah, it was, it was an like ice a, cream social. Yeah, that's it, right, right. Sorry, ice cream social. That's what it was. Um, and, and someone had mentioned that you work on burn pits. So I, I, I came and talked to you about that. Um, and then, you know, from there, we just had a few more discussions on how do we, you know, turn this into something, one, to spread awareness about this topic among um, you know, both uh, Democrats and Republicans on the House side, but how do we also, uh, you know, expand expand that to, to the Senate side, and and how do we turn those things into legislation? I mean, for me, I think I left uh, Congressman Wenstrup's office fairly shortly after that. I think I was there for maybe another month or two before I came to the Senate. But uh, Evelise and I kept in touch on burn pits and then other legislative items. Um, and again, like everybody on the Hill knows, you know shooting somebody an email saying, hey, let's grab a coffee. Doesn't necessarily mean you'll actually drink coffee, but typically you'll talk about, uh, you know, everything from, you know, work issues to you know, whatever else comes up. But I, we always consistently um, talk through um, how we can work together, get our bosses um, on the same page on certain things. And that's where I think, you know, and I know Grace is going to get into the bipartisan nature of, of how things work on the Hill. It's, it's a lot easier to find common ground with folks than people think. Um, and, you know, obviously, Congressman Wenstrup and Congressman Ruiz didn't agree on certain core issues, but on the issues that they, they, they did agree on, they got a lot done. Um, and, and they liked each other a lot. They did. And they're both doctors, right? So they, they were approaching doctors. these things from, from, a, from a certain perspective that, you know, regardless of party, others didn't. So I think that was great. And I think that's what brought Evely Sana together uh, to work on those, those issues, um, you know, partially drawing that inspiration from the way that our bosses did. Um, I love hearing how you guys met because when I first, I mean, uh, full disclosure, I used to work with Nick in the Senate as well. And when I asked Nick, who, who from the house side did you work closely with? He immediately brought up Ibelisa and talked about your background and how, how you guys learned about burn pits and work together. Um, and I, I love hearing that story. And if you guys want to talk a little bit more about um, the differences that you saw in working in the House versus now, you know, Nick, you, you worked in the Senate for a few years, and at least you started out in the Senate. Um, could, could you guys talk a little bit, at least if you want to start, about the differences? Um, and maybe, at least, if you could get into a little bit about what it looks like to work for a caucus and what caucuses are. I threw a little bit at you if you just want to run with that. <laughs> Yes, yes, of course. Uh, well, the house where it's at, all due respect to all Senate people. Uh, um, just kidding. But um, well, I like the house much better because it is faster pace um, and I get to be closer to the member than uh, working on the Senate. A lot of my colleagues who are legislative assistants, advisors, you know, they don't really get close to the senator until they develop a higher level like LD or senior advisor on a very specific topic that you know it's happening at current events or they have to staff a member in a committee activity which not all legislative assistants do so I really really liked that connect to have that connection with the congressman especially because he was my mentor 
Um, but uh, working on the Senate as a staff assistant, it's also very fast paced. There are more, um, well, as you know, the senators represent a whole state, so they have more staff uh, and they have bigger offices. The House, uh, you know, members of Congress represent the specific districts within a state, so they have less staff. The DC staff, it's about like seven, eight people, nine people most, um, and then they have their district offices. Senate offices are quite different in the sense that the DC staff can be like 20 people. <laughs> I remember Senator Boxer had like a two-story a two um a two-story office where Senator Kamala Harris is now in the Hart building. And um, they had like around 18, 19 people. So, and, and on top of that, they have their state offices, right? So um, each of them, oh, also the legislative assistants work on uh, specific issue areas, like one or two or three that they really specialize on. Legislative assistants on the House side are generalist and they handle 18, 19 issue areas at the same time. I myself handled 18 issue areas within my portfolio when I was a legislative assistant. And also um, the growing process to, to go up the ladder from like intern to legislative assistant or legislative director on the Senate side is, is lower pace because it's more specialized. Um, and the, on the House side is very fast. You can be an intern for six months and then a staff assistant for a year and then a legislative correspondent for um, you know, six months to a year and then boom, you're a legislative assistant. So, um, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty much a main difference that I see besides obviously the more specific uh, jurisdictional um, differences between each chamber. But when it comes to Hill life, I think that's that's the biggest difference. And then working for our caucus, um, it is it is by camp. Our caucus is by camera, um, so that means that all members pay dues, and uh, we have four Hispanic senators, and we constantly work with their offices as well, um, and we also work with the members of Congress on the House side. Um, my job is more of a generalist. In the caucus, it's more you have to be like a liaison between the member's interests, get to know the members. Um, it is very similar to the work that leadership offices do. They don't really manage a specific issue area and advise a specific member of Congress on one specific topic. It's more like, I will make sure that we remain a coalition and we agree on a consistent messaging and we advance a common legislative agenda for the betterment of whatever the mission is. In, in this case, is to advance uh, legislation that is going to benefit Hispanic, um, his, the Hispanic community throughout the nation. So we have to be on top of messaging and the bills and endorsing bills and decide what is going to be our caucus, our, our position as a caucus on certain issue areas, specifically immigration, uh, military, national defense, um, you know, housing, education, things that impact the Latino community. I mean, all issues are Latino issues, but um, there's certainly uh, issues that are more important according to the legislative agenda that leadership sets. Um, that, so that's, that's pretty much it. That's really educational. Um, I, I think a lot of folks uh, don't know exactly what it looks like to work on a caucus and how many different caucuses there are. Uh, and how you know they contribute to the dynamics on the Hill and, and moving agendas and efforts forward. Um, so thank you for going into that. And um, Nick, do you wanna speak a little bit to maybe the differences that you saw between the House and the Senate? Um, now you're in the Senate, so you've stayed there. I don't know what your plans are in the future. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm gonna respectfully disagree with Ivelisse on where it's at. I think <laughs> I've, uh, I will say I actually enjoyed both both my time in the House and the Senate. It's it, they are different though, and I think Evelise touched on on those points. Um, the only thing I'll add is, you know, because the congressmen and women are closer to their constituents, they they typically have maybe an issue area that they care a lot about, uh, maybe more than anything else. And I think, you know, that that may be um, um, an environmental issue in your district. It may be a military base in your district. It could be. Um, you know, any number of things that specifically um, impact that uh, member of Congress versus a senator who's going to have that issue as well in his or her state, uh, but they're, they're dealing with a, a lot uh, more issues. Uh, and so uh, they may not be as passionate about one, one thing. Um, the other thing I would say, uh, you know, the Senate is a bit uh, slower paced. 
Uh, and even working for a personal office versus a committee has been uh, quite a bit different. And I'm sure Jeremy can talk to that as well. But uh, what, I've, what I've certainly noticed is on the committee, uh, there's a lot more policy and a bit less politics. Um, and on the intelligence committee specifically, uh, it's very bipartisan. Uh, we, we share spaces. Uh, we don't um, have separate spaces for, for different sides of the aisle, which means um, the Democrats hear all my phone calls and the Republicans hear all the Democrats' phone calls and we're all in the same spot. And, and really what that does, uh, I often forget who's who uh, down there and we all work together. And we just recently passed our Intelligence Authorization Act out of committee on a vote uh, of 16 to zero. And I think um, that type of bipartisanship doesn't often make it into the news, but it's, it's happening. Um, and there are a lot of examples of that, both in um, you know, not just the Intel Committee, but in the Armed Services Committee and other committees uh, on the Hill as well. Things do get done and people do work together. Um, I, I know that when Nick first brought up the dynamics as far as just physically sharing office space with folks from, you know, both sides of the aisle, um, that's pretty unique to his committee that he works on, I believe. Um, I know that Jeremy has a lot more experience working with other committees as well. Um, and we're going to get to that because I want to talk a little bit more in depth about what that looks like. Um, but we joked a little bit earlier about what, you know, does Congress do? Do they do anything? And really, at the end of the day, Congress serves its constituents and Congress basically has to answer to them for a variety of reasons um, that we won't get into, but I want to see what that looks like. Um, Congress, congressional work can actually impact everyday life. Um, and, you know, these elected officials serve their constituents. And I know that Ian has talked to me a little bit about what that looks like. And I wonder if you could, Ian, just thread the needle for us a bit. You know, how does constituent casework influence the priorities in Senator Dianne Feinstein's office. Um, and I, you have pretty fresh eyes to the way that things are working on the Hill too. So I'm hoping that you can tell us, you know, from bird's eye view, what that looks like when it comes to impacting everyday life. Sure, well, um, uh, constituent interest drives, uh, you know, so much of what we do here. We get a report every morning uh, telling us what people called in about the day before. And of course, as you can imagine, a state of uh, roughly 40 million people, there are a lot of calls and emails. Um, so we have the report every morning. We, we see what, what's on people's minds. Um, and then we will also get individual mail or emails passed up to us from the caseworkers, maybe particular issues that they are not able to handle uh, at their level that maybe require us to engage directly with uh, another government agency, the State Department, uh, Department of Defense. Um, uh, I'll give you an example. We recently had a constituent um, who, uh, a group of constituents who wrote in with concerns about high levels of cancer for certain military specialties. Um, and uh, uh, so we looked into it a little bit, and then we uh, were able to get an amendment into the Defense Authorization Act last year requiring the Department of Defense to do a study on the prevalence of these cancers within these, this narrow population of individuals. Um, and so now we have the data, and Department of Defense is analyzing the data. We'll follow up. And if, there, if we find something there worth pursuing, then we'll pursue legislation uh, to address that, that problem. But it's really not unusual that, that we will have a piece of constituent mail that will perhaps uh, alert me to um, a bill or a letter that the Senator might be interested in signing on to regarding a particular issue. And so uh, that, that person's email or call will sort of prompt me to dig a little deeper into it and, uh, and uh, you know, investigate whether that's something that the Senator wants to be more involved in. And then I'll present that opportunity to the Senator and she'll decide whether or not she wants to engage. So it really is, it is very important. Um, uh, you know, and with a large state, uh, I think with any state, I would assume this is the case even for house offices. Um, uh, it's a, a balance between sort of receiving information from constituents and also trying to save some time to be proactive 
and go out and look for issues and, and concerns and to engage government agencies. So you have to balance your time looking towards the district and also looking towards the rest of federal government for uh, issues that need to be addressed. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, today we're talking with four, you know, policy folks. You guys are the, what I say, policy wonks in DC, right? And you, you're describing what it looks like to work with your district offices back in the state in California and those caseworkers who and, and how those you know two roles basically intertwine in every office right where they have to prioritize what sort of casework they're getting kind of overloaded with and maybe there's a legislative solution here so maybe we need to elevate this over to the folks in DC and you know connect them with the constituents to have a, a bigger discussion about what's going on, what are the trends that are being seen, and can we do anything about this? Am I painting a, a rosy picture or is that? Sure. No, no that, that's, that's absolutely correct. And it may not be something that's generating a high volume of email or calls. Maybe it's just one email or one call that is identified by the caseworkers as something that should be addressed, uh, that needs to be addressed by the policy staff here. And so they'll send it and we'll take a look at it and see if it's something that we can assist with. And another, another good example recently of the engagement with uh, casework is uh, in Afghanistan. There were a lot of uh, family members, uh, former colleagues of, uh, of people back in California who were stuck in Afghanistan and they were looking for direction and what to do, uh, how to try to get out. And so we engaged with the State Department uh, as did offices across the Hill and the State Department set up a system that, um, that we could provide that information about specific individuals uh, to try and assist them. That's a great example. Um, and Jeremy, I know that you've mentioned that you're dealing with a lot of what's going on with Afghanistan right now, which we don't have to get a whole lot into, but I really want to learn more about what it's like to work on your committee and your past at committee experience and how that's different from working for a personal office, um, whether that just means reprioritizing um, your portfolio and what's important and how you serve the senators um, or your senator that you advise and how you work with you know, your colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Throwing a lot at you. <laughs> Well, I, I, I greatly enjoy working, uh, working on the committees, um, I, but I've always, uh, I've always recommended, uh, if, if possible, that committee staff uh, spend some time in, in a personal office. I think that that's good experience for them, um, not this committee, but a previous committee I worked for. Um, I was basically the only staffer who had been on a personal office. Uh, every other person on there had never worked in one, and, um, you know, I, I, whether it's like, Ivelisse has worked on a campaign. When you're up close to the members like that and you see how hard they work to get here, you have a certain respect and appreciation for those members who aren't the chairman that you also work for. I mentioned there's seven Republicans. My boss is Senator uh, uh, Rob Portman from Ohio, but I, I have six other also bosses that I serve. And um, it's important for me to know what's important to them, what's important to their constituents so that I can be a good committee staffer uh, to them and to thus, you know, the Congress and and the people, um, but it it is different. But um, I, I do encourage my committee staff uh, 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 colleagues to remember remember the personal office and remember that um, that those constituents are our ultimate bosses. Um, do you think you could give us an example, some somewhat of an example of? you know, what it's like to work with the other six offices that you advise or help day in and day out um, versus, you know, taking care of your one senator if you're working in a personal office? Mm -hmm. Sure. It's, um, you know, it, it's like, I think like Ivelisse mentioned earlier, uh, the more senior you get up, you get more specialized and it's important to realize that some of the folks in the personal offices are much more generalist. So you have that knowledge um, and sometimes you get information before they do. And so you, you need to recognize um, when they need that information. Like, I think a, a huge part of Capitol Hill is 
um, is information sharing. And if somebody has a piece of information and you don't, uh, you feel like you're in a bad spot and, and you want to, you want information so you can give it to your boss because you don't want your boss to think you don't know it. Um, so it's, it's a lot of that of knowing what do the members care about and, uh, and, and sharing. So, you know, whether it's Afghanistan or whether it's the border, um, you know, the, the committee staff, sometimes we're the first to get information from the executive branch. Um, and it's our job to make sure that that information gets disseminated down and, and, and everything. And so that we can be that resource, um, you know, to those, to those personal office. Right. Right. Um, they're, you know, invaluable when you have those connections with the appropriate committee staff um, and you can just, you know, pick up the phone and, and say, what's going on? You know, tell me what I need to know from my boss. How do I brief them? Um, Nick, you now being on committee because you had been serving in personal offices up until this committee assignment that you're with now. Um, I know you talked a lot about the bipartisanship that's unique to the Intel committee, um, but can you tell us a little bit about uh, the same thing Jeremy was talking about with you know what's different between working for a personal office as a national security advisor and now working on committee staff with a team, a bipartisan team? Sure. No, thanks for the question. I think, you know, Jeremy really um, touched on a lot of it. And ultimately, the constituents um, are, are the reason that we that we come to work every day. Uh, what's what's interesting about the the intelligence committee versus the jobs that I've had before, um, I, you know, I don't necessarily work a lot on state specific issues as much now. Um, it's a lot more looking at the broader um, again, the intelligence work that's being done uh, within the U.S. government. So, uh, you know, in that respect, when I was in a personal office, I would take a lot of meetings uh, with different um, associations or groups that were uh, advocating for a, a certain policy issue. Um, and I do less of that now. Now I focus a lot more on my portfolio on the committee. Um, and again, much like Jeremy said, I, I also do that for um, not just my boss, Senator Cornyn, uh, but also Vice Chairman Rubio, and also really um, anybody else on the committee that, uh, that, that needs information on that topic. Now, I do have a counterpart on majority staff uh, with whom I work on every issue area that I'm assigned. Um, so typically, um, you know, we work together to, to, get to, to, get to, to get to that outcome. Um, but that's, those, those are some of the biggest differences. It's working on, on on policy items, um, uh, you know, work, working for maybe more than one, just one senator, and uh, and and being a little uh, less focused on on issues that are specifically happening in a certain state, um, and and looking at it more broadly through that national security lens on on the national level. Okay, um, so let's let's keep the bipartisanship conversation going a bit. Um, and I know, let's go back to you, Jeremy. I know that you were, correct me if I'm wrong, part of Senator McCain's um, effort with Senator Sanders, Bernie Sanders. Um, they, they had a collective effort years ago to improve veterans affairs, uh, to put it simply, because I know that's a very um, expansive effort. Uh, could you talk, us, talk to us a little bit about that legislative effort? You know, how did it work? Maybe walk us through the negotiation process and you know, ultimately that resulted in President Obama signing a bill into law. So, you know, it's a success at the end of the day. So could you just tell us what that was all about, what that looked like? Sure. Well, that that uh, one issue kind of wraps into everything we've talked about. So it started really with a constituent issue. We had constituents in Arizona who were unable to get veterans care, who were reaching out to their members of Congress, who also reached out to the media. And uh, we found out that there was, um, there was an issue, not just in Arizona, but across the nation where the VA's uh, scheduling system for veterans didn't reflect reality, that they were able to change things in the IT system to make it look like their systems were better at scheduling veteran appointments than they were. And veterans were being denied care. They were, they were receiving care that was delayed. Some veterans died while awaiting for care. And so it was a very serious issue. Um, and it was 2014. Uh, the Democrats were in charge of the House, or sorry, of the Senate. Uh, uh, the Republicans were in charge of the House. President Obama was in the White House. So we had a mix. We had a, a split Congress and a, you know, different, different White House. 
Um, and so the only way that this problem was going to get solved was going to be bipartisan. Otherwise, it was just going to turn into bickering and people yelling at each other for two years until the next election. And so my boss at the time, Senator John McCain, said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to bicker. I don't want to point fingers. I want, I want to solve this problem. Well, the chairman of the committee was socialist uh, uh, independent Senator Bernie Sanders, who, who believes in a lot of things uh, regarding health care that are different than most Republicans, including Senator John McCain. But we had to work through that. And so um, it was interesting. The two of them met uh, in a room and talked about what they could agree to, what they couldn't agree to. Uh, and then it was a short meeting. And then they left the room. And then us uh, staffers then had to figure out what it all meant, what they just said. <laughs> we had to turn what they said into legislation, which there's a bit of a translation issue there sometimes. So we fought for several weeks. Uh, we also had to talk to the House because whatever we passed, it also had to pass the House. So we went and worked with Speaker Boehner's staff to make sure that whatever we were working on could also pass the House Republican Conference. But we were in a Democratic Senate. So we had to, you know, we had to get the Democrats to agree to it too. Um, so we ended up with, uh, with a compromise. Um, the big compromise on our side was that we got, for the first time ever, the VA Choice Program, which was veterans would be allowed to go get medical care uh, from doctors in their communities. They would no longer be stuck to have to go to a VA clinic and only a VA clinic to get care. Um, but then we also recognized that there was a lot at the VA that needed to be improved. There were some resources that they needed number one, a new scheduling system and electronic records. Uh, so we increased resources and funding. Uh, and that was what Senator Sanders had pressed for. Um, and so at the end of the day, we, we came up with a compromise and there were Republicans who did not like our bill uh, and there were Democrats who did not like our bill. Uh, but there was a good coalition in the middle. Um, and so Bernie Sanders and John McCain went to the Senate floor and uh, I think it passed with 89 votes in the Senate. And I forget what the House vote was, uh, but it passed obviously, Senator uh, Barack Obama signed it into law. And uh, the program has changed over the years. I think it's gotten better. It's improved. Um, and But it all was born out of that, that crisis that could have easily, very easily been just a partisan war of one side accusing the other side of not caring about veterans. And I think that my boss at the time and Senator Sanders and his staff, to their credit, uh, said that they wanted to avoid that. And, and so we did. Um, so then maybe at the end of the day, whenever you have a piece of legislation that's strongly opposed by some folks on both sides of the aisle, you have something good. But <laughs> um, just as well as being supported by folks on both sides of the aisle. Um, and I, I think that walking through the dynamics of, you know, the House and Senate structure at the time, political structure and the White House structure and how all of that ultimately resulted in a piece of legislation that was signed into law to better the veterans affairs and veterans across the country. You know, that's a great story, but to date, look at, you know, our Senate structure now. I wonder, Jeremy, could you kind of educate us a little bit about the power structure of the Senate right now, especially how that translates to power structure at the committee level and how that's working today? Sure, yeah, so it's a 50-50 Senate, there's 50, uh, senators who caucus with the Democrats and 50 with the Republicans and uh, Vice President Harris uh, cast the tie-breaking vote um, for the 51st. So the Democrats are in the majority. They have all the chairmanships. And um, every, I think every committee is a little different. I think Nick's committee might be a little bit different. But, um, you know, in general, uh, in order to pass legislation, you, you know, you have to get a majority within the committee. Uh, but we set up a special rule. So if we're ever tied seven to seven, on a piece of legislation or a nominee, then the majority leader has the right to bring that legislation to the floor, even though it was tied seven to seven. And so that's kind of the compromise that we've worked out. Um, you know, the, we, we, but even, even if it was not 50-50, if it was 52 to 48, um, you know, we have the filibuster threshold in the Senate of 60 votes. And so we work really hard as staffers to find legislation that's not just going to barely get to 60 votes or we're, we're trying to find legislation that really all senators can agree on. And, um, you know, we can't do that in every instance and we couldn't do it in the VA instance, but we work really hard on some smaller issues that um, that are really important to certain states and certain senators, but that um, that we can pass by what's called unanimous consent. So if all 100 senators 
can agree to it, then, then we can pass a piece of legislation into law. Uh, and we work, we, staffers work really hard on that. I'd say that's, that's kind of our main effort. Um, and then obviously we work on things like reconciliation and the budget appropriations and those get real, um, you know, more d divisive. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you look, we pass a couple hundred laws every Congress. And so when people say, well, Congress doesn't do anything, I say, well, we passed a couple hundred laws. And so, so each of those laws was worked on, you know, by staffers and, and most of those were probably done, you know, by unanimous consent or overwhelming bipartisanship. So it is happening up here. And of course, those don't get the headlines, you know, so <laughs> constituents and, and everybody who's just not paying attention because, you know, we don't have a thousand hours in every day. We don't see that. Um, but I love the, the story of the professional bipartisanship that we're all talking about. And, you know, Nick and Evelise, I'm going to go back to you guys, um, talk about your friendship a bit more because your friendship stemmed from initially professional bipartisanship efforts. So can you tell us a bit more about how you guys have worked together in a bipartisan way, and then ultimately how you guys stayed friends even after Nick abandoned the House and went over to the Senate. <laughs> yeah, I'll just quickly say, um, you know, on 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 the on the second piece of that, um, you know, the the Hill is really about relationships. I think ultimately, um, it's about information and it's about it's about having a good relationship with folks that you work with. Um, and for me, that's always gone, uh, you know, beyond party lines. Again, I don't, I don't know half the time who's on, in what party uh, among the staff in our committee. And uh, you know, obviously, Evelise was uh, someone who was very passionate about uh, helping veterans, uh, and not just that, but that was one of the items that I, that I, you know, greatly admired and thought, okay, this is great. We can continue to work on this topic uh, even after I leave uh, the house. And so, you know, we remain in touch on that. But you know, more importantly. Uh, it was um, just making sure that um, we talked about all kinds of other things, whether that's a professional trajectory or, you know, where, where we want to end up, what we want to do, and being able to, to call someone uh, if you need some opinion about, hey, what's happening in the house? You know, what are you guys working on? What, what do you think is going to pass uh, on, on this? And just being able to have that information and being able to, you know, use that uh, in, in conversations with the boss. So, uh, I would say, you know, it's it's definitely um, one of those things that I, when I when I talk to to folks here on the hill, um, yeah, they're they're definitely genuine friendships. Uh, they 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 come with, you know, having the ability to call somebody to get some information. But sometimes it's just, hey, let's grab a cup of coffee. It's it's Friday afternoon. I don't, you know, I'm, I don't feel like working anymore. Let's let's talk about something else. And so sometimes you you know you have an opportunity to do that as well. Absolutely, I think um, Nick and I shared a lot about our backgrounds and how different they were and how much they complemented each other for the issue area that we wanted to work on. Um, and we both agreed that the issue that we were working on should not be bipartisan or should not be partisan in the same way, in the first place. Like it should be bipartisan to take care of our veterans, period. And those people sacrifice their lives on the line of duty and it was just not fair for either one of us to leave them alone to face the consequences of um, toxic exposures and military bases. So starting from there, it was easier. And I had never worked on military issues before and I am not a veteran myself. So Nick was a very, very good resource for me to learn more about the military and Department of Defense and how things work. And I would, you know, get some intel from another, let's say a committee staffer or from another colleague or from a group. Uh, and I would go to Nick and pick up the phone or like meet up with him and ask him, is this true? Do you, <laughs> do you actually go through this? Check up. You actually experience this, or was your, you know, su superior really like saying these things? Because there's a lot of, you know, um, obstacles to to get that information, and that's how Nick and I would bounce ideas off each other. Um, and regardless of you know part alliance, uh, regardless of what uh, members of Congress we were serving, we were able to reach a really good compromise. And there are many times where. Um, 
you know, he would come to me with an idea. I would say, that's not enough. Uh, my boss wants more. Or maybe I would go to him with an idea and he would tell me, um, I, I can't commit my boss to this. Um, but then we would sit down and say, here's what I can commit my boss to. Here's what my boss wants. Um, and we would just work really hard to get that done. Thank you for, for going into detail about how that all worked. Um, and I think it speaks volumes to one, the uh, climate on the Hill among staffers that you guys have remained friends, you've worked together and stayed in touch. And um, two, to your character, to be able to look past, you know, any of the surface level things that distract a lot of us and work together on such an important issue. Um, and I, I love that behind the scenes uh, when it comes to working together on the Hill, living in DC amongst, you know, folks who just, you know, we all have different outlooks on life. At the end of the day, we're all doing the same job on the Hill, right? And so we, and we all have sort of the same goals on the Hill um, and have to get along and, and have friendships. And Ian, I know that you, you came onto the Hill in May, but I think you've had some sort of like book club going on with folks that's brought others together from both sides of the aisle just to get a little lighthearted and talk about how friendships have developed. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that and how that maybe helps your bipartisanship efforts um, professionally as well. Sure. Uh, so when I uh, came to DC in 2011 to do congressional affairs um, uh, for the National Guard Bureau, um, I you know, I wanted to meet people on the Hill would be a, help me do my job. And I also found that I liked people that worked on the Hill. I mean, they're smart, energetic, engaging. Um, I, I felt like uh, most of the people that I, I dealt with were really doing it for the right reason. So I like people on the Hill. And so I wanted to, to meet more of them. So I started a, uh, a book club and started with a few uh, good friends that I'd met on the Hill. And they helped introduce me to other people that might be interested. And so we have a book club of about 12 or 13 people now. Um, it started, gosh, I want to say seven or eight years ago, Jeremy, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, that's right. We get, yeah, we get together every two to three months um, at my house and I cook a dinner and I do a little bartending and um, we actually spend some time talking about the book, which is, it, it was all... Uh, defense and foreign policy uh, Senate staffers. And um, now most of them have gone on to do other things. Most don't work on the Hill anymore, but we still get together and, and do the same thing every two to three months. Uh, even during COVID, we did it virtually several times. So that has been really rewarding. And you're talking about bipartisanship. It didn't even occur to me to, to think about it in those terms. But in fact, when I started the book club, I I made a rule that it had to be 50-50 Democrat and Republican. Um, and it has been that way ever since. So if, if, uh, um, if someone leaves, which has been very rare, we, we have to get someone of that party to, to join. Um, and I think that's been, I think that's made it better um, because it has prevented it from becoming sort of a, a partisan, um, uh, you know, whining session, um, because uh, a lot of partisan whining is sort of based on um, bad information uh, that falls apart um, when confronted. So actually, I think it's, it's made for more intelligent conversation, because people, I think, are a little more careful about um, about what they say in, in that regard and, and um, have a little more serious talk. And we've all become very good friends. And, and uh, in terms of forming friendships on the Hill, um, you know, it, it really doesn't matter to me whether someone's a Democrat or Republican. I, I feel like the, the people here are really, there are a lot of really good people trying to do the right thing and engage in serious public service. Um, and, you know, I happen to ag agree most often with those of, of my party, but um, uh, it's not, I, I don't sense it as, um, as anything nasty, not that, I, not that I deal with in my day-to-day -day work. And maybe some of that is because the defense and foreign policy national security portfolio is, is more bipartisan than some. Um, and there are honest, strong disagreements uh, routinely, but th that uh, 
doesn't really get in the way of respecting uh, and even liking uh, the people who hold other views. I think that was a big reason why I thought you all would be a great representation of what it looks like to work in a bipartisan manner. And um, you, you all have a national security veterans related background in the issues you've worked on. And Ian, I, I love the story about your book club because it just immediately brings to mind sort of the RBG Scalia friendships that we, we all, I think, are yearning for again, right? Um, where- Even Liz, let's join the book club. He's got, he's probably got two more. Seriously, I, I was gonna say, can we join? <laughs> You know, it, the size of the book club is limited by the size of my kitchen table, so I'm at capacity, but when, but when I get room, you're on the list. It's exclusive, Perfect. right? <laughs> um, I, but, you know, and you can disagree, but at the end of the day, come away from whatever disagreement it is, sharpening your own arguments, too. If you don't have the conversations with folks across the aisle that you're friends with and you trust, then you're not going to even be able to sharpen your own arguments. And um, I think that you guys are just a great representation of what the Vanderbilt Project on Unity and American Democracy is really trying to shine a light on. Um, and it, you know, we know that this happens behind the curtain in Congress, that you guys are sort of the ones driving the bipartisanship and making sure that at the end of the day, we have solutions for constituents and we are doing work on the Hill. And so with, we're, we're going to try and wrap this up a bit, but before we do, I think one of the biggest questions that we got from folks who've registered to, to view this today is what sort of advice can you leave them with? Um, so, you know, this, we have a lot of Vanderbilt students, undergrad, graduate, alumni even who have registered and have asked, you know, if there's one crucial piece of advice that you could offer to a college student or just anyone at any point in their career, like you said, Ian, you came in a little bit later, um, who's interested in working on the Hill, what would it be? Um, some of you've already spoken to that a little bit. I don't know if you have other pieces of advice, um, but how would you, you know, encourage folks who are maybe outside of that typical like poli-sci realm from, you know, all of us probably have a, a degree in political science or studied it at one point, but how would you encourage those who are maybe outside of that realm to consider the Hill and kind of give their expertise to the policy wonks on the Hill? Um, actually, Ivelisse, let's we'll start with you, sorry. Yes, um, I have a lot of advice, but if I could, condense it in in just a few lines, I would say be confident, um, especially for people of color on the Hill. It is um, an environment where um, it is not always like that, but it can get a little um, daunting to be a person of color in Congress. And uh, you got to keep, you know, breaking the glass ceiling, um, the racial glass ceiling, the gender glass ceiling, and you got to be confident and uh, make friends. Don't be afraid to um, get coffees and look at it from a transactional point of view. Uh, informational coffees are very normal in Washington, D.C., and we're in the people business, and you better get used to talk to people without feeling like you are doing like a nasty transactional conversation because it is not like that. It's about making genuine connections and making lots of friends. That's great advice. Um, endless coffees on the hill. Uh, and everybody is used to coffees. Asking someone to coffee is a normal thing. So just get used to the caffeine high. <laughs> um, Nick, what about you? Yeah, um, I guess, you know, related uh, to, to what Evely said, uh, don't feel like you don't belong. Uh, no matter what your background is, what you work on, what you're passionate about, uh, the Hill has got room for everybody. Uh, and it is a very competitive place to work, obviously, because there's a lot of people who want to work here. Um, but whether you're a pilot or you're an engineer or you're uh, a lawyer, not that we have lawyers on the Hill, <laughs> but, uh, you know, whatever it is that you're, you're passionate about, um, do that and do it well. Um, and then, you know, you may find that, uh, you know, you, you, you work in the field that you're good at for a few years before coming to the Hill, or you may come to the Hill right out of undergrad um, to pursue work in that policy area, you know, whether it's immigration, healthcare, education, it, it could be anything. 
Um, one thing I will say is that I, I think I feel personally that I'm a better um, staffer uh, on the committee that I work because of my military background. Um, and so I think, you know, doing the job you're passionate about um, before coming to the Hill, I think can be helpful, but it's certainly not necessary. And plenty of people uh, come here because they're passionate about a, a, a topic or an issue area and they want to uh, impact positive change as soon as they can. And they come and do that. So uh, for what it's worth, um, yeah, just do, do what you want to do, uh, apply where you want to apply and then have those coffees to, to help realize that dream. That's great advice. And I, I know that Nick hasn't touched on it yet, but um, he, you know, also brings a lot of unique perspective to the table just because of, you know, the fact that he, you're, you're bilingual, is that right? That's right. Yeah, I was born in Germany. So I speak uh, German fluently uh, and, and English as well. So um, it's actually one of the things that brought us together because we're both bilingual and his wife is a uh, new immigrant, correct me if I'm wrong, Nick. But correct, Emma, so is my mother. <laughs> yes, and, and we're both Catholic. Uh, so it's like another thing that we had in common. And it was like, I can't believe we're both are from like completely different backgrounds, but we have so much in common already. <laughs> yep. And it just takes getting to know someone as a person and, and you make those connections that on surface level, you wouldn't realize that you have, which is why those coffees and you know genuine conversations are so important. Um, so thanks for highlighting that. Um, Ian, I'm gonna go to you next because I'm gonna leave the Vanderbilt grad for last. <laughs> Ian, what, what, what kind of advice would you give to anybody who's just been, who's trying to go through basically what you've just been through and getting onto the Hill? Yeah, so um, as Nick said, uh, and Ivelisse, the, the Hill needs people of every background. Um, the work here is so diverse that uh, don't, don't think there's sort of one, uh, one, one resume that works. It, that's not true. But I guess the advice I would, I would give is to find ways to uh, either work with the Hill or work with people who work with the Hill. Uh, grow your network towards the Hill. Um, make personal connections, build relationships and reputations with people who uh, can vouch for you. Um, because when you're looking for work, people on the Hill who are hiring, uh, they are going to want someone that they can reach out to that they trust um, to ask about this person's work. And maybe they trust the person because of the job that that person is in uh, or what have you. But I would, I would say try to get as close to the Hill as you can. And it doesn't have to be in Washington. Uh, maybe you can form relationships with people that work in, in, in members, constituent services, offices in a district or in, um, you know, just any way that you can. And my way of working in legislative affairs was a great way to meet a lot of people on the Hill. It was probably the second best experience that I could have to working on the Hill. Uh, a lot of people work their way up. Uh, from the lowest ranks in an office um, and learn the process that way. And that is a great way to do it. But then you've got people who, like me, who come in late in a career, um, certainly mid-career, uh, all different types are needed here. That's great advice. Great, great advice. And Jeremy, from the Vanderbilt grad himself, what sort of advice would you offer to folks who are trying to go through this, maybe the same way that you did? Um, sure. Well, I'll, I'll just echo what everyone else said before was also great advice. Um, and, uh, you know, like Ian said, the networking towards the Hill. So, you know, if you want to work on healthcare policy on the Hill and are having a hard time, you know, there are healthcare organizations in D.C. or around the country you could work for, get experience, then come back a year later and come to a congressional office and say, hey, I've got a year of experience working on healthcare policy. But, you know, can I apply again? And, uh, and that that's extremely helpful. But um, I, I guess I'll also give a, a piece of advice. I, I just want to tell everyone what is that once you get up here is like, please keep learning. Um, don't don't be stovepiped and just continue to read, uh, you know, things that you already know to be true. Um, that that's one of the things up here that's so hard is dealing with folks who clearly, you know, only get their information from from one side of the source. And I think um, I, I know that Nick and Ian aren't like this. I, I don't think Evelise says either. And so to be a successful Hill staffer, you've got to uh, consume and read and learn from the entire spectrum, see other people's perspectives, 
um, because no one has a monopoly on the truth. And um, you, you're just your success as a Hill staffer will just be so much more if you do that than if you uh, stovepipe yourself and only stuck with what you what you believe the, the day you arrived. That's what my Republican friends are for, right? <laughs> what is Fox you saying now? <laughs> Well, with that, that's phenomenal advice. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you all for joining today, uh, joining the Vanderbilt Project on Unity in American Democracy. Um, this has been just a great discussion and I really appreciate your time. I know that time is precious on the Hill um, and I'm sure that the Vanderbilt community is just really grateful for the time you're sharing today. Um, to folks who have follow-up questions, you know how to contact us at the project and we're, we're just really excited that we were able to host you all for this discussion. Thank you.